Good. It's good to be with you guys. It's a really, really, really good Friday, and uh, I'm just glad that you're spending it with us. If we haven't met yet, my name is Grant Trout, and uh, I'm brand new to staff, and so I am helping Freddie, our unbelievably talented worship leader with young adults. Um, And so wife and I moved up here five months ago, and it's such a privilege and honor to be here with you guys. Um, About a year and a half ago, I was working out in Branson, Missouri, random place in Missouri, and uh, my my parents came to visit me, and my two best friends came out to visit me, and they said, hey, uh, we got something planned for you. It's going to be exciting. And they said, we're going to take you to a play. And I was like, man, if there's a list of top 100 things, like it's not a play. <laughs> Guys, do, do you know me? And, and they said, no, it's not any play. It's, it's, it's the Jesus play. And so we're going to see the life of Jesus uh, uh, played out on a screen. And this was not any play. Guys, I showed up. This is a 300-foot stage that wrapped around both sides, 100 live animals in the play. I am in the stands, and there are camels walking down the aisles. There are birds being let out like blowing by my face. And I'm like, are these trained? Like who's getting these back here? And I remember being in this play, but there was a moment that I'll never forget. It's when Jesus saved the demon possessed man. And uh, there's this song that the demon possessed man is, is singing. And I look over and there's this 75 year old usher uh, who's a lady and she has both of her arms raised and she's singing the song and she's, she's crying. The tears are rolling down her face. And I was like, I've got to ask her her story. And so during the intermission, it's a two and a half hour uh, play and I, and I walk up to her and I just said, hey, what did, what did Jesus do for you? And she looks at me and she smiles and she starts welling up with tears again. And she goes, he changed everything about my life. I was in a, I was in a relationship I shouldn't have been in. He brought me out, he brought me to Branson, Missouri. And now every single day I get to watch what my savior did for me as my job. And, and she stopped me and she goes, but, but Grant, I wanna tell you something. She goes, I meet people every single day at this play that tell me they're Christians. And, and, and then I meet, every once in a while, I'll meet someone that has truly encountered the cross of Christ. And I said, what's the difference? Like, how do you, wh- how do you tell? She said, Grant, there's a fire in their eyes and there's a freedom in their heart. And it shook me because I think so many of us, I grew up in a church just like this. We know what this represents. Like, we know what the cross means, but I don't know if we know the power behind this cross. I don't know if we've been truly transformed by this cross. And so on Good Friday, there are so many different directions we could go tonight. We could talk about the physical pain, the crucifixion, the scourging, everything Jesus went through. But as I prayed, I I wanna take us tonight to a story that's only found in the book of Luke. And and, and this story, um, it's it's very simple, but, but what this does is it's gonna paint the most beautiful picture for what true salvation looks like and the power of the cross on one man. And so tonight we're gonna be in Luke 23 and we're gonna be talking about the thief on the cross. And so as we read this story, I just want you guys to to understand the impact of salvation and what the power of the cross can do to one man. And so we're starting in verse 32, um, going through 43. Two others who were criminals were led astray, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, There they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so to paint the scene, we know what happened 2,000 years ago on this day. Jesus has been sentenced to death and they're gonna crucify him. And, And as he's walking up this mountain, I'm reading this story and I'm just like, God, why did you bring two other men into this story? Like why two random thieves? It's, it's the crux of our faith. It's the moment our savior died for our sins. Why are you adding two random criminals to this story? Like don't, don't disrespect respect this moment. And as I prayed about it and thought about it, it was very clear. God wanted to show us on his last moments on earth that you and me are those criminals on the cross. That's where we are at. That's where we start because the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
And the wages of that sin is death. And so we may not be physically on a cross, but where we are all starting out is spiritually dead on a cross in need of a savior. And and what we're gonna see tonight is two different responses. There's two different responses to the same savior. You're looking at the same man on the same cross and you have two totally different responses. And, And what's crazy is that this man woke up and his entire life had been evil, crime, sin, he woke up headed straight to hell. And and during the six hours on the cross, something happened in his life that he walked hand in hand with Jesus into paradise when he died. And so point number one, it's very simple. He acknowledged that he was a sinner. Luke 23, 40 through 41, but the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. If we don't start right here, we don't start at all. It's interesting because Matthew and Mark also talk about the thief on the cross, but what's totally different is that they paint the picture as both of the criminals insulting Jesus. Luke's the only one that says one of the criminals stood up and rebuked the other one, but the other stories say, no, they both were looking at that cross insulting Jesus. And so the question is, What happened to where this man suddenly starts rebuking the other criminal and starts defending Jesus? And what scholars have put together through all the different accounts of the gospels is that he was close enough in proximity to Jesus to when he was there being raised up on the cross and the big crowds were there. The most famous man on the planet, there's a massive crowd and he witnessed Jesus respond to the people throwing things at him, spitting, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And that did something to this man's heart, we believe, that transformed everything. Because when you look long enough at Jesus on the cross, you begin to realize this is a love that I cannot explain. This is a love that I cannot outrun. I don't understand that type of love. Like, why is he not fighting back? I grew up in a church very similar to this. I heard about God and I knew the cross and everything, but man, like I ran. And this story is so close to my heart because I went every other direction but towards Jesus on that cross. Then I chased alcohol, I chased sports, I chased drugs, and it left me in a place where I finally found myself, if I keep going down this track, I don't know if I'm gonna be alive. I stood outside of an emergency room six years ago about to overdose on too many drugs, uppers, uppers and downers. And it was in that moment that I realized I am a sinner and I need something better than what I'm doing right now. I was that thief on the cross. Like that's who I was, man. And this is why this is so, so deep to my heart because this day, what Jesus did this day is why I'm standing before you today. Jesus changed everything about my life. To the Christian in the room that's going, why does this matter to me? Like I, I've known Jesus, that, that wasn't my story. I, I've, been, I've been a believer for a while. The moment we get the heart posture that we're okay and that we're good and that we stop looking at the cross and stop remembering our sin, that's when we think that our self-righteousness got us to where we're at today. That's the accidental Pharisee that is a slow fade. The reason that I'm bringing us back here is we have to remember that if we did not sin, there didn't need to be a savior. It was your and I sin that put Jesus on that cross. And if we don't sit in the weight of that, then we will not be truly transformed by the power of the cross. We won't. Point number two is very simple. He recognized Jesus as savior. He said in verse 41, but this man has done nothing wrong. I wanna tell you today, you were bought with a price by the precious blood of Jesus. You were bought with a price. In the moment that we stop forgetting and stop thinking that we need a savior, but this man was sitting here, and as he sat there, he watched this man and he said, Father, forgive them, and something in his heart said, you know what, he doesn't even deserve this. He elevates Jesus, and 2 Corinthians 5.21 clearly encapsulates the gospel. It says this, for our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus came, 
like we just sang about. And as his blood streamed out of his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his toes, he was thinking of you. In your deepest, darkest moment of sin, as they nailed him to that cross, he looked out and he saw you in that worst part. And he said, you're worth it. He said, you are worth it. I'm gonna hang on so that you can let go. We have a beautiful savior. And the reason that he came is because he wants to be back with us. And he said, I'm gonna pay the full price. The full price of everything that we've done. Jesus comes down and goes, my blood is gonna pay all of that. And so to continue on in my story, I ended up going to UC Santa Barbara in California to play basketball. And about halfway through freshman year, I get a career ending injury. And the doctor says, hey, you can never play basketball again. That was my purpose. That was my identity. It was everything I wanted. And I was running from the Lord. And that's when I started turning to some, stu- su- some substances that weren't, weren't good for me. And there was, I'll never forget it. It was February 14th, 2016. I'm intoxicated and, I'm, and I'm, I just know that I need to leave the spot that I'm in. And I walk out that door and I literally start running. I just, I just take off, I start running. And I think it was just an outward demonstration of what was happening inside of my heart. All I knew was that I needed to get away from here. And I start running and I remember I trip and I look up and there's a cop car, lights on, put in jail. Next day I get out and they hand me my shoes back and uh, they, they take your laces. And so they gave me back these two different laces. And I remember being in this moment where I went back to my dorm and it was the first time that I sat there and I felt like the Lord totally spoke to my heart and he just said, Grant, stop running because I ran to the cross for you. Stop running. And I don't know where you're at right now. I don't. You could know Jesus for 50 years and you're walking with Jesus, but you're like, I've just, I've strayed. Or you've never met Jesus and you're running right now. I want you to know that no matter how dark, how deep, how slow that fade's been, he wants to remind you today that he did this for you, to be with you. He loves you so much. Jesus paid it all for you. And he's telling you right now, come back to me, enjoy me. Jesus stepped in the gap because when we understand that we're a sinner, we have created this gap between us and a holy and perfect God. And I know we know this and I know it's simple, but it's it's transformational. That when we understand that we could not get across to God, so Jesus came down, put his arms out on that cross and said, cross over me and you can get back into a relationship with the Father. Jesus sat on that cross and he will. He wants you. So now that he's acknowledged he's a sinner, he's acknowledged Jesus as Savior, he, he, he has this last ask and plea for help. He just says, he asked Jesus to save him. In verse 42, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, I, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. There are two things that we can do with this, with this conversation. There's two thieves and there's two different responses. It's the free gift that Jesus offers us. We can do two things with a free gift. We can receive it or we can reject it. But that is what Jesus has left up for you. That's the moment Jesus has left up for you. You can receive it or you can reject it, but you cannot earn it. Ephesians 2, eight through nine, it's the simplest form of the gospel. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. That's it. That's the simple gospel that Jesus came down and he said, I'm going to create this story of a thief on a cross who's never been to church, who's never done a good deed. All he's done is sin. And here's how I'm going to show you he's saved. It is simply by believing what I did on the cross. It's that simple. And if we truly understand that our sin put him there, that he's the savior that rose above it and that by his blood, we are set free, that changes everything. Because shame, it is dropped off on that cross. My guilt, it's dropped off on that cross. Everything represented in that room, when you put your faith in him, it is nailed to that cross. What's so interesting is as all the crowds said, come down, 
Like, save yourself. If you're truly the Christ, save yourself. In the midst of all that roar, there was just one voice that said, will you just please save me? And that's all we have to do. And if you don't know Jesus, it is the simple, will you please save me? And that transforms our lives. And that puts someone that almost overdosed up here to boldly proclaim to you that Jesus has changed everything about my life. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He was bound so we could be set free. I, after going to jail, I, uh, you have to show up to this court date and it's this big moment and you've got to pay the fine. And it's this kind of really scary moment and I, I didn't know what was going to happen and I knew I had to pay it. And I'm walking up um, and I'm like, okay, like, God, I know that I, I like, this is, I did this, I have to pay this. And, and I'm walking up and they call my name and I'm walking up and they said, hey, uh, you're, no, you're actually, you're, you're great to go. You're good to go. I said, what do you mean? I've got to pay the fine. Like, what do you mean? They said, no, your coach, um, he called us and he said that he would totally take care of it and he paid for it all. You're good to go. And that is what Jesus does for us. When we have sinned and the enemy grabs you and he drags you and he throws you in front of the court, in front of the judge and he says, look, I caught her. I caught him doing that thing again. Look at what I saw them doing. Look, God, they're guilty, they're guilty. Jesus steps off the stand, walks over. He's like, you see these holes? It's paid for, it's done. My blood covers that because there was a cup with my name on it of all of my father's wrath and I drank that cup and I flipped it over and I said, it is finished. So fear death, enemy, you have no rule on my life. Jesus has set me free. And that is your story. If you know Jesus, that is your story. And if you don't, he has you here for a reason. I am alive to simply proclaim this message. I believe if the thief could come back and talk to us right now and get up like I'm talking to you, I guarantee you he would be like, the difference between me and you is that you're hearing it now and you can go tell other people. The thief never got to share his faith, never once. And if we've been transformed by this cross, we gotta tell everybody, like everybody's gotta hear about it. And so thank you guys for being here tonight because this is a really, really, really good Friday. Because when we look at that cross, we, we do not see a torture symbol. We see hope and freedom and salvation. And as we sit in the weight of what he endured for you and I, I just want you to thank him. We don't thank him enough. Go to sleep thanking him, wake up thanking him, not just on Easter weekend, like thank him. He did that for you and he wants to remind you that he did it for the joy set before him, which was being with you. He endured the cross for you. I'm gonna pray and then I think Drew's gonna come on out. Father, thank you that you endured the cross for us and that as they whipped you and nailed you, you hung on, Jesus, for us. And I pray that the transformational power of that cross would move this room, would move me, God. And would I just propel in freedom that I'm not bound because you were bound. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you did for us. And thank you that the story is not over, that in two days, our King gets up. Jesus, thank you. Pray all this in your name. Amen.